So I'm Robert Ovetz. I'm with Professor Michael Clare, who is the Hampshire College Professor of Peace and World Security Studies. He's also the author of the brand new book, The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources. Um, so I, I, I'd like to start off by asking you a question that's on everybody's minds, Professor Clare. Uh, why are oil prices so high? And, and can we look forward to um, high oil prices and high uh, uh, fossil fuel costs in the, for the long term? Yeah, I, I think there are three reasons why prices of oil are so high, and two of those are never going to change. One of them is the situation in the Middle East, the tension in the Middle East, the prospect of a war with Iran or Israeli attacking Iran, Israel attacking Iran, the U.S. attacking Iran. So long as that threat hangs out there on the horizon, prices are going to stay high, partly because speculators are buying oil on the expectation that prices will go even higher. So they buy oil at this price, hoping to make a big profit if prices go even higher. That's the transitory factor. If we have peace in the Middle East, prices could come down. The other two factors are not transitory, and one of those is competition, increased competition for oil. With the rise of China, the growth of a vast new middle class in China and India and Brazil and Turkey and so on, hundreds of millions of new car buying consumers in the developing world, all needing to fill up their gas tank, competing with American consumers for what's, what's available on the oil market, that's pushing up prices. And the third factor, which is also irreversible, is the disappearance of cheap, easy oil, the kind of oil that would come spouting out of the ground when you drilled into the earth. There is no more of that cheap, easy oil. What's left is what I call tough oil, which is deep, deep underground, deep offshore, Arctic oil, and things like Canadian tar sands and shale oil. Very expensive to drill and process, very environmentally hazardous, and this is, this is going to be the future of oil, very costly, and those costs will be passed on to the consumer. So what do you think is the reason why we keep going for that, that hard oil? Why do we keep going out into the ocean, into the rainforest, into the Arctic to find a resource that's dwindling anyways? What, what's the politics behind why we don't make the shift? Well, it's a, it, it's, it's a complicated picture. Uh, the oil companies have one business model, which is to sell consumers oil. They're not interested in converting their business to alternative fuels. They want to have a product that they could sell at the gas stations. They want to keep their refineries busy. So they have no incentive to switch to anything else. And as long as we consumers are intent on relying on our existing form of transportation of cars, we're going to be dependent on that product. And because all of the easy sources of oil are gone, we're going to, we're going to have to rely on that very expensive, difficult oil. In addition to the environmental costs, which we, we learned in a catastrophic way with the, the, all the attention with the, the, the leak, um, uh, of the uh, of the rig in in the Gulf of Mexico, but also with the daily constant seepage of oil, uh, uh, the leakage, uh, spills in Nigeria and Australia in the last few years. There's another cost to that, and it's something that you talked very fascinatingly about in your book, Resource Wars, which came out I think about a decade ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. The new landscape of global conflict. Um, Talk about resource wars. What are the social and economic and political costs of these struggles over our dwindling uh, natural resources that we use to power our global economy? Well, again, there, there are two forces at work here. One is rising demand uh, with, the, with the rise of China. Uh, this is an extraordinary, unprecedented development in world history where you have uh, the emergence in a very short period of time of a powerhouse of a new economy with a population of one and a half billion people needing all at once copper, iron, aluminum, oil, natural gas, everything imaginable in vast amounts. 
and competing with the older industrial powers, the US and Japan and Europe and so on, for what's available, coinciding at the same time with a gradual disappearance or dwindling of the historic sources of supply for many of these resources. So there's a collision between su supply and demand. In many cases, this is leading to conflict over who controls what's left. And ex examples are, are the disputes in the East China Sea and the South China Sea between China and its neighbors over who controls the undersea oil and gas reserves. These have gotten very heated in recent months. Um, a couple of the other uh, uh, conflicts that um, get a lot of attention, but not in the way that you've written about it, is the conflict, for example, in Israel-Palestine or India and Pakistan. A lot of times we think of these conflicts as being religiously motivated or about land, when there is a lot about land and the way that the British drew the territories. But in a very fascinating way, you've also documented that there are also these kinds of conflicts over oil as well as over timber, over water. Can you talk about how we can understand the changing nature of many of these conflicts in the last few decades over these other resources as well as, okay. as oil? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, you, you know, the human, the, the human species is divided into many different families, many different ethnic groups and tribal groups, and there have always been differences between them. And historically, one way people have settled that is by, is by spreading out and, and people, you know, moving away and to, to exploit new areas. That's why people moved to the Western Hemisphere historically, first from Siberia, from the native, what we call the native peoples, and then the European peoples. But we're coming to the end of the available supply of land to invade or to colonize, and so people are butting up against each other, and things like water are becoming very precious. And in the Middle East, in particular, water is very scarce. With global warming, it's gonna become more scarce still, and populations are rising, so differences over religion get magnified when people have to fight over things like water that are essential for survival, for the production of food, simply to live. And that's what we're seeing in Israel and Palestine. The Israelis control the supply of water in the West Bank, and they deny it to the Palestinians, and they provide Jewish settlers with a much larger supply of water. And this exacerbates the differences that would be there in any case and heats up the conflict. Same is true between India and Pakistan, are deeply divided over the water resources of the Indus River. And this is going to get worse as the large parts of the world get drier because of global warming. Layers. Melts, melts and that that water supply is depleted we we see a very similar example of this in california um, as the sierra snowpack uh, dwindles um, there's increasing struggles over the water flows downstream between fishers and fishing people and uh, native americans environmentalists farmers and of the need for for people to live and th this this becomes much more pronounced when you have what are called transboundary water disputes when a river crosses a, a boundary. For example, the Colorado River, which supplies Southern California with water, exits into Mexico, and the people in Mexico are getting less and less of their due share of the Colorado because so much of it is being diverted to California before it reaches them. And this is the kind of thing that provokes conflict between countries. That's what's happening between India and Pakistan. But we have those kind of disputes with Mexico. And um, there are times when the Colorado even doesn't even make it to Mexico. That's it right. runs dry because it's so over overexploited. Exactly. Um, I, I want to get back to, to oil a little bit, um, especially with all the attention to uh, Afghanistan in the last few days with the horrific uh, slaughter of, of, uh, of people in a village by a, what may be one soldier. And look at it in terms of uh, the struggle over the race for what's left, the struggle over resources. 
Uh, several years ago, um, the U.S. military released an analysis that Afghanistan may have, I think it was up to $2 trillion on exploited resources, natural resources, uh, raw materials uh, under the ground. Um, and, and thinking back to uh, Iraq, um, you wrote a book about uh, the next Vietnam War back in the early 1970s. And um, I wonder if we can think about the second war in Iraq, the continuing war in Afghanistan, uh, in this way as, as part of this struggle over the, the, to control the flow of oil. Can you talk about um, perhaps how our place, our invasion of, in Iraq and our continuation in Afghanistan is part of a, a larger, perhaps a neoliberal strategy of, of restructuring these resource wealthy countries? This, that was a long question, and it yes. would, uh, you know, I, I deliver a whole class on that, so I, I, we can't take up all the time to say that, and, and people can read my book, Blood and Oil, which is devoted to exactly this topic. But let me say in a nutshell that, you know, prior to 1945, the United States wasn't interested in that area at all, and it was during World War II when, when our oil started to reach its peak of production and begin its path towards decline, that President Roosevelt decided that the U.S. had to have a foothold in the Middle East to ensure access to the oil of the Middle East. And that changed American policy, and to this day, it is American strategic policy to be a dominant actor, a dominant player in the Persian Gulf area, and to ensure that nobody challenges nobody greater than the United States comes to power that can thrust us out of that area so that we always control the flow of oil from the Middle East, from the Persian Gulf. And that's enshrined in the Carter Doctrine of January 1980 that says the oil flow from the Persian Gulf is a vital interest of the U.S. and will use any means necessary, including military force, to protect that flow. That's the basis on which President Bush, number one, ordered U.S. troops to fight in the first Persian Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm. And I think that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was a continuation of that war because the, the first war did not end in the elimination of the threat posed by Saddam Hussein to American domination of the Persian Gulf area and the economic sanctions that followed did not achieve that result either. And the second President Bush decided to finish the job which he felt his father left unfinished to eliminate Saddam Hussein's threat to U.S. domination once and for all. So Iraq, because it controlled its oil resources much like virtually all the OPEC oil producing countries in the world controlled it and, and held back a lot of those resources to fund its various, uh, you could say, Keynesian welfare policies. Um, in what degree was the invasion of Iraq an attempt to privatize the oil supply of, of Iraq? That, I think that was a subordinate in, uh, motive. The dominant motive was to eliminate Saddam Hussein as a threat to control of the entire region. American leaders, especially Dick Cheney, who is the architect of the war, even more than George Bush, feared, and he said this, that Saddam Hussein would seek to uh, eventually to control Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, which would give him control over 60% of the world's oil. And that could not be permitted. That, would be, that was forbidden from the American elite's point of view. So it's not just Iraq oil. Iraqi oil that was at stake. It was the entire region that was at stake and control, the geopolitical control of the region. And let me say something else. It, it's not that we would get all of that oil. Most of that goes to Europe, Japan, China, and India. And, and that control of that flow is absolutely crucial to the domination of the world as seen by American foreign policy elites. We do not want to surrender that control, that, that you know, what, you know, the higher power that, are, that arises, the higher command of the world economy that derived from controlling the, the world's flow of oil. 
That's what the war was about. A, a, a repressive government that controls its oil supply has leverage to disrupt the global economy. Is, is that what Absolutely. you're implying? So yeah. being able to free it up from state ownership, which yeah, can serve it, political purposes. It, it's, and in this case, it was, not, it was being able to dominate the entire Gulf region. And that's what the struggle with Iran that we face today is all about. The Iranians say they will punish the U.S. by closing the Strait of Hormoz. And that would cut off the flow of one-third of the world's tradable oil if that were to happen. The U.S. is not going to allow that to happen. There's kind of an irony, though, because as you mentioned at the outset, whenever there's a, a, a threat of military intervention, the price of oil shoots up. This happened back in 02, right? So in some ways, aren't we kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by making these so-called hidden threats of military intervention. Yeah. Uh, and remember, Israel is also a factor in this equation. The Israelis, by their threats, are also pushing up the price of oil. That's absolutely right. What, what is uh, the, the endless war in Iraq, I think is probably a better way than saying first and second war. What does the endless war in Iraq have to do with the war on terrorism? And you document this very well in your book, Blood and Oil, and the documentary that was made based on your book. Talk about the war on terrorism and oil. War on terrorism, as I understand it, is a war against al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, and that has nothing to do with Iraq. Indirectly, it has an effect because to combat al-Qaeda, I'm sorry, to combat Iraq, the U.S. based a large army in Saudi Arabia, and that's what pushed Saddam pushed Osama bin Laden, who had been an ally of the U.S. and a CIA asset in Afghanistan in the war against Soviet occupation, been a, a recipient of U.S. training and assistance, into an enemy of the United States because of the presence of so many infidels, as he saw it, in Saudi Arabia, which was then his base of operations, his, his area of support. And so he turned into an enemy of the United States, and he determined that uh, the, the goal of every true Muslim was to drive the United States out of the Muslim Holy Land and to overthrow the Saudi royal family because of their collusion with the United States. And that set off a path of terror that led to 9-11. And so there is a link, but there's no link to Iraq. What could we say about the, the central importance of oil in the global economy? Why is it so important for our global capitalist economy that we have oil? What role does oil play um, in the production of goods and services um, in the prosperity of the Western industrialized countries? Well, first of all, oil is essential to all the world's economies, whether they're capitalist, socialist, or communist, like China uh, claims to be. And China now is the world's leading consumer of energy. It, it overtook the United States in 2009 and is expected to overtake us in the consumption of oil in the not too distant future. It's industrialism and what's called the motorization of the world, that is people's reliance on uh, internal combustion engines that drives the, con the demand for oil. And when you have a world transportation system based on oil, which is airplanes, ships, trucks, trains, cars, and everything else, 98% of world transportation energy comes from oil. So globalization, economic globalization writ large, is and almost 100% dependent on oil, 98%. So if that diminishes, the world economy as we know it collapses. And even when it becomes scarce, uh, the world economy tremors. We have not yet figured out a, what a post-petroleum world economy will look like. And this is going to be the most, probably the most difficult challenge to the world economy in the 21st century because oil will run out before midway into the century. So we, we tend to celebrate um, how we have a high-tech economy, at least in the, in the developed, quote, developed countries of the world. 
How much does this high-tech economy rely on these resources that cause so many of these conflicts? 100%. Talk about, for example, the cell phones and the hybrid cars. What does it have to do with these depleted resources and the, and the conflicts? Around? Well, many of these n new technologies like cell phones and laptops depend very much on very exotic minerals, the so-called rare earths or coltan, columbite and tantalum, which come from war zones like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which are produced under uh, medieval conditions of warlords uh, enslaving people virtually to produce them and fighting amongst each other. They're sustaining wars in the eastern DR Congo. So we're very dependent on these uh, exotic resources that, that are essential to the, to, to the modern high-tech economy. We have not yet envisioned and will have to envision a, an economy based entirely on renewables and recycling and new materials that are not based on finite non-renewable resources. But that is the task of the 21st century. One of the major transformations in the 20th century that we saw was the displacement of human labor with uh, automation technology. You, you had mentioned this earlier. Um, and particularly in the after World War II, energy became uh, a substitute as well for automation in order to increase productivity and decrease the reliance on labor. One of the big issues we face right now is where's all the jobs? Yes, what, yes. what role does automation uh, IT and energy have to do with the declining reliance on human labor? Uh, you know, it, it depends where in the world you look, because in the high-tech, uh, high-cost economies, we see the trend that you describe, where automation makes it possible to eliminate many jobs. But in many cases, the uh, hard work of building, um, put assembling the TVs and the computers still is human intensive and, and that's all been outsourced to low wage countries, first to Mexico, now to, then to China, now it's being outsourced to Bangladesh and to Vietnam and so on. So there's still plenty of places where labor is used but often under hellish conditions and I don't see that going away. So, Professor Clare, what do we do about this, this, this conflict and struggle over these declining resources? Well, I think we have to get over the notion that the planet is infinitely abundant with resources and, and that we can keep turning to the planet to supply us with what, our, what we need or to fight over them because that day is rapidly coming to an end and we have to envision a new way of life based on New, a new economy based on renewable sources of energy and other materials, on efficiency, on conservation, on recycling, and on living our, our lives differently so that we're, we maximize the use of existing resources rather than maximizing the exploitation of the planet. And I think if we re-envision our lives that way, more built around community and bartering and local food production, things like that, there'll be less conflict and less poverty in the world. In the Bay Area, we have, um, we have a very vibrant movement of people who are using unused space in yards and abandoned lots to grow food and, and be able to distribute it locally without, um, organically, also without the input of, of fossil fuels and uh, uh, self-sustainability self movement. Um, what do you think about the, the importance of food as, as a solution to this problem? Well, food is going to be another contested area uh, in the years ahead, just like oil that we've spoken about and minerals that we spoke about, because the demand for food has got to rise with another two billion people being added to the world population and many areas becoming drier because of global warming, so water is going to disappear. So food, too, is going to become a scarce commodity, or I should say arable land on which you could grow food. One of the things I write about in my book is the 
pro the phenomenon of land grabs, where rich companies and rich corporations, rich governments are buying land in Africa and in Latin America to, to pros profit on the future scarcity of food or to supply food to their own population even while leave, leaving people in these other countries like Ethiopia and Sudan and Zimbabwe and Kenya starving. So thinking of new ways to produce food locally, as you say, with minimal need for chemicals and all of the like, is it has to be another part of the adaptation to the new world that we talk, we've been talking about. Food is, food is a really fascinating way to look at many of these conflicts. Um, right. There's a lot of discussion about how all of our technological toys are full of coltan and oil, uh, but food itself also has embedded water in it, land, Lots fossil fuels. Oil. oil. The way we produce food in this country uses a, a huge amount of oil to, for the farm machinery, for the pesticides, and the other chemicals used in producing food to transport the food thousands of miles away. And as oil becomes more scarce and costly, the price of food rises. And this produces a tremendous penalty for poor people who have to shoulder those higher costs of food. So the local food movement becomes even more crucial, especially in poor neighborhoods. Well, Professor Clara, it's been a pleasure speaking oh. with you. And um, I look forward to uh, hearing more about your new book, The Race for What's Left. Thank you very much.